these notes are going to cover the rise, governing, and fall of Napoleon Bonaparte, an emperor in France. So after the French Revolution, France was left with a very diverse, very intricate relationship of several different key pieces. For one, there's a large secular society in France, which meant that society as a whole was focusing on non-religious topics. Um, in the John Green video about the French Revolution, it talked about how the French had essentially banned the Catholic Church within their country for several decades, and so there was an outcry against the Catholic Church and religion in general. There's also a surge of nationalism. People were very proud to be French. People were very outspoken about their French identity and making France as strong of a nation as it could. And there's also a desire for more democratic practices. Remember that the French Revolution was a backlash against the monarchy system, and so it was led by people who wanted to implement more rights for all Frenchmen and voting and that sort of feature to the French government. Napoleon comes to power with the French Revolution as there was a series of, of government systems, none of which were very strong, and he actually comes and takes over power and then is ultimately going to try and take the French government and make it an empire across all of Europe. So he was born in Corsica and he was born into a, not a supremely wealthy family, but a, a decently well-off family. He attended military school and joined the army. He was actually very, very good as a ruler in France, as a military ruler in France, as a military leader in France. In fact, he remains very popular in France because he was leading several key military victories during the French Revolution. In 1799, he leads a group of soldiers through what's called a coup d'etat, or a military takeover of the government. That's coup d'etat, it's a French term, which is helpful since Napoleon is in France, for when the military rises up and controls the government. He also helps take over um, several key battles where they are fighting the British, the Russians, and the Austrians. He has what's called a plebiscite put into place, which is a vote amongst the French people. So here again is your de democratic ideas, right? A vote of the people to approve a new constitution. Under that constitution, Napoleon himself has a lot of power. And in 1804, he crowns himself the emperor of France. So France went having from monarchy to instituting a democracy in which they then end up with an emperor with essentially complete power. So he rules essentially as a king. But Napoleon's not really a bad political figure. One of the things he does is he creates a national banking system which helps to unify French currency, stabilize interest rates, promote loans, which promotes economic growth, which is really effective. He creates a tax collection system that is more fair. Remember we talked about with the estate system and how the third estate or the poor French had to pay significantly more taxes than any other member of society, and that was unfair, and so he not only makes this new tax collection system efficient, but he also makes it more equitable across socioeconomic lines. He also creates public schools, which is a phenomenal turn of events because in the 1800s in Europe and in America, most people who are going to school are only doing so because they are wealthy, white, and male. And so by establishing public-run schools, it allows for the education of what was a third estate in France. It allows for the education of all, essentially, French men, rather than just sending that group of wealthy children to the educational facilities of private institutions. He also signs an agreement with the Pope, a concordat, 
which is signed basically reinstating the Pope's power. He restores Catholicism. Now remember at the beginning of these notes, we talked about a secular system in France where they had kicked out the Pope. And he brings him back. Napoleon brings Catholicism and brings religion back to the culture of France. He also creates the Napoleonic Code, which is a law code, which basically just means they are written down. So these are written laws that he then implements throughout his empire, including not just the areas France takes over, like um, Central Europe and Eastern Europe, but also you know, Napoleon is the emperor who was ruling over Haiti, and Napoleon is the emperor who was ruling over the Louisiana Purchase. So the a lot of the laws that were instilled in New Orleans and cities in the Midwest were all came to be as a part of the Napoleonic Code. So, one of the things that he does is he attempts to retake Saint Domingue. Remember, that is Haiti, and that had fallen away from France when Toussaint Louverture led a rebellion, led a slave revolt in Haiti. He sold the United States to the Louisiana Territory because he was needing the funding in order to help finance his expeditions and his, his conquests in Europe. He also defeats British forces, Russian forces, Austrians, the Swedes, and he forces them to sign peace treaties in which he basically maintains control of almost all of Europe for several years. All right, so this will show you that there is, you know, the French Empire itself and all the area up to 1813 that Napoleon had controlled in the pink. And then you have a series of battles that are going to show up. The solid reds like Trafalgar and Austerlitz are French victories that they win, obviously. And then when you have a couple that are going to pop up that have white centers like Aspern, those were where the French would have lost a battle. So if you notice, there are very, very few French defeats in this conquest of Europe. Now this is going to show you a video of the Battle of Trafalgar. The Battle of Trafalgar is off the coast of, this is Portugal and Spain, this is the Strait of Gibraltar, which is the connection between Europe and Africa, and you will see them battle it out. Here come the boats, and at the bottom it just runs a rolling scroll that Admiral Nelson ordered his ships to engage the enemy and engage the French more closely, and so they attacked the French, and at 1 p.m. the French and Spanish were working together and their line had been broken, and so the British were winning, and Admiral Nelson actually dies, the guy who was in charge of the the British fleet. 3.30, the French counterattack is going to fail. You're going to start to see some ships sinking and burning. And by 5 o'clock, 23 ships in the Spanish and French fleets were captured or destroyed. All right. So that was the Battle of Trafalgar, and then, which happened off the coast of Gibraltar. And then the Battle of Austerlitz, which is here in the middle of France, um, is going to show you that Napoleon split the Allied line right down the middle, and that is one of the most effective ways to win a battle is when you split your enemy in half. So, at the Battle of Trafalgar, Napoleon loses and needs to figure out another way to conquer Europe because his goal was to come around the coast, around Gibraltar, take over Portugal, and then use that as a spring point to take over the UK, Great Britain, and Ireland. So what he comes up with is called the Continental System. Now the Continental System was his plan to make Europe completely self-sufficient. He wanted Europe to operate as its own nation, obviously under the French Empire, and then within Europe they would be able to simply trade amongst themselves, remember the mercantilism concept of being able to be self-sufficient. He wanted to use the colonies of the European powers in order to make them all one continent that was unified together and not needing trade with the United States or the Chinese or the Mughals or the Ottomans. So he set up a blockade of Britain, which his hope was to sort of starve the British out, but it wasn't very good because the British smugglers were actually very, very effective. 
So he fights a war across the peninsula, the Iberian Peninsula. That's what that, this peninsular war is, the Iberian Peninsula, as in where Spain and Portugal are. So his plan is to march across Spain and attack Portugal. He is very effective in Spain. Um, he instilled his brother as the king of Spain, but he ultimately loses 300,000 men, which is really hard. And so then he's not able to take over Portugal along with it. He then takes over, or attempts to take over Russia. He sends 420,000 soldiers into Russia. And he starts in June, and so you'd think that he'd have enough time with that many men. But um, what the Russians do really well is that as they're retreating, as the French are invading and the Russians retreat, they do what's called scorched earth, where they basically set everything on fire. And because of that, the French soldiers can't live off of the Russian land because everything is burnt. So there, there are no... Far, there's no farmland, there's no crops, there's no animals, there's nothing for them to scavenge on, which is how an army would feed itself as it marched across a continent. So by the time Napoleon got to Moscow, it was cold, it was winter, they were starving, and they had to back out. And so several different countries lead fights against Napoleon, where he is defeated and exiled to the island of Elba, which was in the Caribbean. And Louis the 18th is appointed the king. Now remember, with the French Revolution, you had Louis the 16th, and he's, he's taken and, and kidnapped and killed, and we put in this democracy, and up comes Napoleon. Well, now they're putting a, a Louis back into power. Um, but Napoleon's supporters, because remember that Napoleon didn't really do a terrible job in domestic policy, so he had some support. So they re-overthrow the government and they bring him back out of exile. And Napoleon didn't learn his lesson. And so instead, he attempted to again take over Great Britain and he's defeated single-handedly down at the Battle of Waterloo, which is one of the most famous battles of European history. And because of this, Europe is going to meet at what's called the Congress of Vienna, and they're going to put into place some practices that are going to helpfully for them banish the empire builders, banish the capability to take over an entire continent um, by one country. And there's going to be a lot of nationalism that emerges because of that, where people are going to be, be very proud to be all of their independent ethnicities, which is going to cause a series of rebellions in the 1840s, most notably in 1848. So that's it. Um, that is the last of our Napoleon notes. As always, if you have any questions, let me know.